Reddit, what is your creepiest, most unnerving story, real or not? Please creep us out. There are already 3022 submissions so this will probably get buried. But here is a true story. In the late 70s, my uncle was studying medicine at the University of Chicago. After a morning class, he decided that he would hitchhike back home to Lincoln Park on the north side instead of pay for a taxi. A man drove up in a Plymouth satellite and offered my uncle a ride. The man looked normal and seemed friendly, light-hearted even. So my uncle got in the car and they started driving towards Lakeshore Drive. However, once they got there, the man drove south on Lakeshore instead of north, towards Lincoln Park. My uncle told the man he was going the wrong way and to turn around and head north. The man looked at my uncle, put his hand on his knee and said, No son, you are coming with me and smiled darkly at him. My uncle froze in panic, and when they hit traffic near the south shore, he quickly unlocked the passenger door and ran away without looking back. A year or two later on a cold December day, my uncle was having coffee in a cafe with my future aunt when he caught something on the TV that made his blood run cold. He saw the man that had picked him up from school that day the year before. He had been arrested for the suspected rape and killing of over 20 young men and boys. The man on the television was John Wayne Gacy, and he had removed the door handle off the passenger side door to prevent the men he picked up from escaping. I took this picture, Imga webpage, to test out my new camera in Colorado. There was no one behind me, the only people near, 1000 feet away in the cabin didn't have hands that look like that. I can't figure out what the hell it is. Be cool if it really was a ghost hand. Not creepy but ghostly. Edit. Lol that snow that was falling on me. We were in the Rockers. Also, I searched for a rock that resembled that for like an hour to no avail. It'd be interesting if a snowflake caused that shape. This is long but my favorite. I have an odd habit a friend recently picked up on. A habit I developed about a year ago. He noticed that when I enter a room, any room, and shut the door, I turn my face away from it and close my eyes until I hear the lock click. Only after the door is fully closed will I open them. He gave me a hard time about it until I told him where it started. I work for a water seal company in St. Paul. We produce sealant for exposed wood decks, boats, that kind of thing. You hear about sealant being a dirty word in the Ashland at Falls Ironton area, but not all those companies were part of the infamous Ethel summer that wiped out the local economy in the 50s. I got sent to an industrial park outside of Itcher Falls on business. I checked into this dismal hotel, the Hotel Umbra, that looked like the decor hadn't been changed since 1930. The lobby wallpaper had gone yellow from decades of cigarette smoke and everything had a fine layer of dust, including the old man behind the front desk. I hoped that the room would be in better shape. Mine was on the fourth floor. Being an old place, the hotel had a rickety cable elevator, the kind with the double set sob doors, one of those flexing metal gates, and a solid outer pair of doors. I shut the gate and latched it, and pressed the tiny black button for my floor. Just as the outer elevator doors were about to close, I was startled by the face of a young woman rushing at the gap between them. She was too late, the doors shut, and after a moment the elevator ascended. I thought nothing of it, until I needed to take the elevator back down for one of my bags. I entered, pushed the button for the lobby, and pressed my tired back to the elevator wall opposite the doors. They had nearly completely shut when again I was surprised by a woman's face moving towards the gap, staring into the elevator through the gate. Too late to place her hand in to stop the doors from closing. This time I sprang forward and held the door open button, and after a moment the doors lurched and slid open. I waited a moment. From the opening I could see partly down the hallway, no one in sight, still holding the button down. I slid open the metal gate and craned my head into the hallway to look down the other direction. No one. No trace of the girl. No recently shut hotel room door. No footsteps. No jingle of keys. I released the button, but did not lean back against the wall. I stood directly in front of where the gap in the doors would be, in the center of the elevator. After a pause, the outer doors again began to slide shut, to move towards each other until the space between them was the width of a young girl's face. In that quarter second several fingertips appeared, followed immediately by her face again, rushing from around the corner, staring at me as the doors met. 
I had been watching the gap where I thought she might be, so I saw her she was about 13 years old, and very plain, almost homely, with a pale complexion and neck length dark brown hair that looked must or slightly dirty, I didn't have time to glance down at her visible shoulder, to see what she was wearing. From her behavior I wondered if she was a runaway or a homeless person who had gotten into the building. She had had a glassy, blank expression, tinged with a little desperation, some distant desire or need, a look that could easily be accompanied by the words please help. The next time I passed the front desk, I asked the old man if he'd seen a young girl running through, heard the stories, then, he said between throat clearings, rocking gently in his seat, young Maddie has been here a long time. Takes a liking to gentlemen guests, always been shy, never says a word, not a word, just curious. I told him I hadn't heard any stories, and that there had been a girl taking the stairs and standing in front of my elevator on every floor. That's our Maddie, he said, she likes you then, sweet on you, she just wants to see, that's all, just to see, all she ever does, curious little thing just wants to see. I stayed at the hotel umbra for three nights. It was a four night business trip. The last night I tried sleeping in my car. It didn't help. Let me tell you about young Maddie. You only catch glimpses of her. Of a face with a resigned look of quiet desperation. Dominated by a pair of white, dark eyes, locked doors, barricades. Nothing made a difference. She gets inside. I never saw her longer than half a second. Every time I laid eyes on her she retreated instantly, only to appear again an hour or two later. An hour or two if I was lucky. Let me tell you about where I saw young Maddie. Every time I shut the door to my bathroom, in my hotel room, I saw her. If I watched as I shut it, at the last possible second I'd see the crescent of her face moving fast at the gap. I'd throw the door open to find nothing. Every time I closed the closet or I saw her, if I watched that gap, she'd suddenly be inside the closet, leaning her head to watch me just as it shut. It's as if she knew where to go, where to be, so that my eye would meet hers. But there was never an impact, never a moment when she'd make contact with the door or the wall. The first time I sat at that writing table I saw her, as I closed the large bottom drawer. She rushed at the gap from inside the drawer. Her wide eyes pleading for something I could not give. I pulled the drawer from its rails and threw it to the floor. I did spend that last night in my car. But like I said, it did no good. Tossing and turning on that rental car seat. The back ratcheted as flat as I could get it. I'd have to open my eyes sometimes. And if there was a place for her to dart from my view when I opened them. She did. In the side view mirror. Or peeking over the hood of my car once upside down. At the top of the windshield. As if she was on the roof. I'm back in Saint Paul again. And I've been back for a year. But Maddie hasn't stopped. If I keep my eyes open long enough. If I watch a place long enough. I'll eventually catch sight of movement near the copier in my office. A pile of boxes in an alley. A column in a quiet parking lot and my eye will get there just in time to see her eye retreating from view. There's never anything there when I go to look. So I've stopped looking. That's how I've had to change things since the hotel umbra. I've stopped looking. I keep my eyes shut when I close doors. When I shut drawers and cabinets, fridges, coolers, the trunk of my car. Not all spaces. Just ones that are big enough. At least, that used to work. I was getting ready for bed a few nights ago. Standing in front of my bathroom mirror. Door shut. Cabinets shut. Watching myself floss. I opened up wide to get my molars. I swear I saw fingertips retreat down the back of my throat. Edit. Put in line breaks. Sorry guys didn't notice a formatting problem. Also this isn't mine. Just my favorite I don't know where I got it from it was just in my awesome stories folder. My family and I used to go camping a lot when I was younger. Camping consisted of renting a cabin in the woods and spending a little time in the wilderness. So we consistently rented this cabin in Pennsylvania where we would spend long weekends. When everyone in the family had some time off, my two brothers and I, each being in the 9-12 year old range, would always run off into the woods and bullshit about while my parents did whatever. The cabin was on a mountain. If you followed a dirt road a ways past the cabin, the forest would open and there was a large field on the top. The field was about the size of a football field. Near the edge of the field, on the far side, was a graveyard. The graveyard was pretty small, about 20 graves. 
surrounded by a wrought iron fence. The fence was about 10-12 feet tall with the gothic-ish spikes on the top. The fence had a gate but it was locked with a thick, raster chain and padlock. Being kids were able to spread the gates apart enough to squeeze through. The small gravestones were very old and worn. I remember seeing one dated 1890 something, on top of one of the graves. Just resting on it, was a smooth black stone. It looked like onyx or something, a little smaller than a golf ball but not perfectly round. My older brother pocketed it, we dicked around a little then left, back at the cabin, which had one bedroom, where my parents stayed, and large living room kitchen, where we stayed, we were hanging out while my parents were sleeping in bed, it was probably about 11.30 or so at night when a loud bang, bang, bang happened at the front door, which is right in the living room me and my brothers were all scared shitless, understandably too afraid to answer the door, bang, bang bang again the door shook moments later it sounded like someone was trying to knock it off the hinges my father emerged from the bedroom asking wtf was going on bang the door clashed he knew by the looks on our faces we had no idea he grabbed a wood chopping axe we had and walked over to the door he looked scared shitless himself he swung the door open and there was nothing but the night no one in sight after hounding us for information and us having no idea we went back to bed I think no one slept much, if at all that night. The next day we were back to decking around in the woods and we again found ourselves in the old graveyard. The smooth black stone, that my brother took, was on top of the same grave. We ran, we ran fast. I didn't write this either, this one has stuck with me for two years. The original is still available, here, Fark web page. Search for Echo 5 Juliet, he was the poster, comma I was driving a shortcut from Twentinin Palms, CA to Albuquerque, NM. Twentinin Palms is located in the desolate high desert east of La. The shortcut was all to lane road through total nothingness, except for passing through Amboy, CA. Amboy is a nearly abandoned town nearly as far below sea level as Death Valley, with a dormant volcano and lava field on one side and a salt flat on the other. It was also, at the time, a hotspot for satanic group activity, so I was driving by myself in the afternoon. I stopped in Amboy and snapped a picture of the city sign. Just to prove I was there to friends who dared me to take that route to I-40, I got back in my car and proceeded to drive up into the mountain range between Amboy and I-40. Once I reach the top I am driving north through a canyon with high grass on both sides of the road. Up ahead I see some stuff in the middle of the road. As I approach I slow down to see a red Pontiac Fero stop sideways across both lanes. A suitcase open with clothes scattered everywhere and two bodies laying face down in the road. A man and a woman. I stop a hundred feet or so away and the hair on the back of my neck is standing up. Being a marine. I reach under the seat and pull out a 9mm pistol and chamber around. Something seemed very wrong. It looked too perfect as if it were staged. An ambush. Was I being paranoid? Something was just wrong. Getting out of the car seemed unthinkable. It was the horror movie move. As I scanned the road I saw a line I could drive. Pass the guy in the road on his left. Swerve to the right side of the woman. Behind the Fero and I'd be on the other side. I dropped it into first gear. Punched it and drove the line I planned. I passed the back of the Fiero without hitting it or either of the bodies in the road. I continued forward a couple hundred feet and slowed down so I could breathe and let my heart slow down. As I looked up into the rear view mirror I saw that the two bodies had gotten up to their knees and 20 or so people emerged from the tall grass on either side of the road by the car and bodies. At that moment my right foot mashed the gas, pedal to the floor and did not let up until I had to slow down for the I-40 east on ramp. I will never know what would have happened to me had I gotten out of the car to check on the bodies or stop my car closer to them. Somehow I do not think it would have been good. Sometimes real life can be scarier than a movie. TL. DR. Some psycho staged a car crash outside of Basto to ambush and do unspeakable things to some sucker that would stop to help. It's been a while so it's unlikely anyone would read this except for OP. But what the hell. I was in Taiwan one year when I was younger and had traveled to Biza Night Market. These are popular gatherings that usually operate in the evening. Nearby I spotted a sign for an at cafe in a 5-6 store at all building. Thinking I'd fire off some quick emails. I walked in the dark, small entrance of the building. 
The building was older and hasn't been well maintained, but it's not out of the ordinary in Taiwan. The entrance just had a dark hallway that led to a small elevator. I pressed the elevator call button and entered. The elevator was uncharacteristically new compared to the building, but I didn't think much of it. Like some Chinese buildings, there wasn't a fourth floor. It's considered bad luck since four sounds like death, so it just read one, two, three, five, six, which was usual. I looked for the floor the net cave was at, sixth floor, and pressed the button. It lurched into action quietly and began the ascent. When it stopped, I figured it was my floor so I instinctively began to step out, right before stepping out. However, the sight outside the elevator stopped me. It was pitch dark, only lit by the light in the elevator. It looked like it hasn't been occupied for decades, with some random pieces of furniture covered with white cloth or similar. It was a small building, so each floor was single occupancy, so I could see pretty much the entire floor from the elevator. Thinking I must have gotten the wrong floor, I checked the light, that indicates which floor you're on. Strangely, there was nothing, none of the indicators were on, but the floor button to the net cave was still lit so I know I haven't gotten there yet. All this happened within a couple of seconds, that's when I noticed a figure moving in the distance of the floor. It was not very visible but I could make out what looks like a person dressed in some kind of gown, moving slowly towards the elevator. I was thoroughly creeped out, so I started pressing the closed door button. As soon as I pressed it, the elevator light flickered off. I am this close to pissing my pants, and it's actually kind of freaking me out thinking back to it. The lights flickered back on under a second and the door closed. The elevator jolted back to life. A few moments later it opened again to the net cave. I am beyond relieved at this point. I walked out immediately and sat down at a computer. After gathering my wits a bit, I walked over to the cashier's desk and told them what I saw. The girl working there listened and her face turned a bit ashen. So I asked her if she heard of Simila. She told me that she's never experienced it, but some co-workers and occasional customers have brought it up. Basically, the building has six floors, and the fourth floor had a history. Apparently the floor used to be a hair salon of sorts, until one of the employees killed herself there for some reason. She slid her wrists over the hair wash station and died. The store continued operations despite stories of weird appearances. When customers got their hair rinsed the water would look a little red, like the customer was bleeding, little things like that. And a couple people reported seeing someone's figure walking away in the mirror. Naturally, the business closed down a few months later. The building owner tried to re-rent the place out, but never had any luck. Most businesses are quite superstitious, and no one wanted to rent the fourth floor after someone had died in it, even at a very cheap price. Finally, after dropping the price to nearly nothing, a stationary supplies store wanted to rent, during the renovations of the floor. However, several accidents would happen, tools would end up in strange places, a mirror from the previous business shattered when no one was near it, and finally a worker had his hand jammed between the elevator doors when it closed on him unexpectedly. The workers refused to continue working and finally, the business left and the building owner finally gave up and shut down the floor. He then had the elevator company come in to replace the panel so that the elevator could not go to the fourth floor. Let me repeat that. The elevator was programmed to never go to the fourth floor. It doesn't even have a button. But for some reason, sometimes when people take the elevator, it would go to the fourth floor and the doors would open. And some, like myself, would see a figure walking around in the dark. Sorry if this has already been told. Try to search which turned up nothing. But you never know. Late at night on a highway in northern Ontario, a woman driving her car is relieved to finally find a gas station that's still open. So she pulls in. The attendant comes out and walks up to the driver's side. He stands there, waiting until she rolls down her window. She slips it down just a crack. How much he asks. She tells him to fill it up. The attendant walks towards the back of the car and stands there a minute. The woman waits. Then looks into the side view mirror, the attendant is just standing there, facing her, she's feeling pretty nervous, wondering why he's not pumping gas, then he walks back up to the window and taps on it, you need to open the flap mom, feeling stupid, the woman reaches down and clicks the gas flap open, the attendant walks back and starts pumping the gas, a minute or so later he finishes, 
and clicks the nozzle back into place on the pump. Then he stands there for a moment. The woman keeps looking at him in the side view mirror, feeling quite ill at ease. She doesn't like this. Being alone at a tiny gas station in the middle of nowhere with only this stranger. The attendant then walks back up to the window and taps on it. She reaches into her purse and takes out her credit card. Rolls open the window just to crack again. And as she passes the card through looks up at the attendant. He's staring down at her with white, frightful eyes. She looks away quickly, really creeped out. And she rolls the window back up as soon as the attendant grasps the card. But he doesn't go to the cash booth. He just stands there a moment. The woman can't bear to look at him again. Finally he says, with a voice muffled through the closed window, Mom, there's a problem with your card. Could you please step inside the cash booth? What's wrong with the card she asks loudly, with a definite strain in her voice. Something's wrong with the barcode. I'll need you to come over to the cash so we can make a call to the company. There's no way she is getting outside her car, on an empty, dark highway, late at night, with only that weirdo around. Besides, she realizes, as a sudden chill overcomes her, how could he know if there was a problem with the barcode if he hadn't even been to the cash desk to swipe it? The woman's breathing suddenly increases as she feels panic creep upon her. She summons up a note of restraint in her voice. Please, can you just call them yourself? Sorry, but I'll need to see some ID. Could you please just step over to the booth? It'll only take a minute. Realizing he won't let it be, she whispers a prayer and reaches into her purse to check for cash. Yes, she has a $50 bill. Clutching it in her hand she unrolls the window just to crack yet again and passes it through. Never mind, I'll just pay cash. Mom, are you sure he asks? What she almost yells, as she accidentally looks up at him again. The same wide, fearful eyes staring down at her. She looks away. Yes, catch, I can fix the card problem. You just need to come over to the phone with me, he says. She's really terrified now, and half screams at the man. Listen asshole, it's cash, that's all you're getting from me, alright, alright, he responds, now you just wait right here and I'll go get your change, don't move, I'll be right back, she can see him out of her peripheral vision, walking backwards towards the booth, always facing her, she can't bear to look his way, she can't imagine what he has in the booth, what if he brings it back with him, fuck the change, she thinks, just as she realizes he also still has her credit card, she can't take this anymore, fuck the card, I'll cancel it, she starts up the car and as soon as it hums to life she tears away and off into the dark night, the attendant is in his booth on the phone, breathing heavily, an official sounding voice on the other end asks, did you tell her, no, the attendant responds, I couldn't, why not, he had a knife and a finger to his lips, I tried to get her out of there, but the whole time he was watching me from the floor behind her seat. This isn't my story, it's something I read in a community I'm a member of on Live Journal. It goes like this, this girl posted a story about something that happened to her mother. Her mother would every now and then drive miles out into the boonies to see her parents. She describes what her mother told her happened to her when she was driving one night. Her mother is driving on a road with cornfields on one side. After a few hours, she sees something lying in the middle of the road so she stops. It's a man lying on his stomach on the road facing the opposite direction. A part of her wants to get out of the car to see if the man is okay. But her instinct begins to sound an alarm that something is not right and that she should stay in the car. She decides to drive around the man and proceed forward. After she is several feet away from the man. She looks in her rear view mirror and sees the man in the road get up and walk into the field. In South Africa, we have a lot of hijackings, and for a while the favored method to stop a car was to play dead in the road. Of course it doesn't take long for people to figure out that stopping to help people on the road is a bad idea and that is where my foaf joins the story. On his way home from work one night, he lived on a small holding. He sees a body in the road about one kilometer from his house. He quickly realized what was up and decided to just drive up onto the pavement, cab for the Yanks I think, and go around the body without stopping. He got home about two minutes later, ran inside and called the police. When he saw them coming down the road, he returned to where he had seen the body to tell them where to start their search. Obviously there was no body, but what they did find was quite surprising. 
Three dead hijackers hiding in the long grass on curb, as it turns out, when he had driven up on the curb to avoid the dead guy, he had crushed all of the accomplices. The dead guy was never found as far as I know. That dude is like accidental Batman. I know this is never going to get read, but this thread is 10 times less scary if you read it while listening to the Ghostbusters theme. I just want everyone in this thread to know that after reading this thread on the couch in the dark at 11pm, I got scared and reached over to switch on the lamp, and the light bulb popped loudly and went out, the new bulbs are in the kitchen, I'm too scared to get off the couch now, I think I may be stuck here till morning, looks for cute, non-threatening puppy and kitten pigs, humans can lick too. My 4 year old daughter was supposedly asleep when I heard noise coming from her upstairs bedroom. I tried to listen but could not make out what was being said. I approached the room, and she stopped talking. Thinking I alarmed her I went into the room. At the time she was sharing it with her 3 year old sister. I walked in and saw the 4 year old sitting up in bed. I smiled and said is everything okay? She said fine. But her sister said they were keeping her up. I asked who? My 4 year old said sorry but that she was talking. When I asked her who she was talking to, my 3 year old sat up and said the girl in the window. She said you were coming. After I shit a brick, I asked who the girl was and they both said a girl comes and stands in front of the window at night and talks to them. Not knowing what to say, I said okay tucked them in and hung around outside their door. The next day I asked about the girl they said she came back but was mad. I waited a few days and asked again. My 4 year old said the girl in the window was still mad. I forgot about it for about a week. When my wife said, who are the girls talking to upstairs? Freaked out I ran upstairs and both girls were sitting under the window looking up. They turned and looked at me and asked if I wanted to meet the girl. When they turned around, disappointed, they said the girl left. It has been about 5 years since and I have not heard about the girl in the window since then. Your daughters have learned the art of trolling at a very early age. It takes about 5 years for a ghost to properly plan anger revenge. It has been reported that some victims of torture, during the act, would retreat into a fantasy world from which they could not wake up. In this catatonic state, the victim lived in a world just like their normal one. Except they weren't being tortured. The only way that they realized they needed to wake up was a note they found in their fantasy world. It would tell them about their condition, and tell them to wake up. Even then, it would often take months until they were ready to discard their fantasy world and please wake up. When I was growing up my little brother, who was 3 at the time, used to sleepwalk through our house at night. He'd walk down to the basement where I slept and crack open my door between 11pm to 2am. He'd then slowly push it open and shuffle inside. When I'd ask what he was doing he'd always stare at the floor and say where's mom I'd tell him that she was upstairs. He would repeat where's mom each night I would take him back upstairs and led him back to bed where he'd fall asleep. One night at about 1am I awoke to hear crying at the bottom of the stairs. I walked out to investigate and he was sitting on the bottom step. I asked him what was wrong and again he said, where's mom I told him she was upstairs and we should go get her. No. He said staring at the floor, there's a bloody head following me, what I asked, he looked up from the floor, stared me right in the eyes, opened his mouth and let out the shrillest blood curdling scream I have ever heard in my life, it scared the living shit out of me, it was so loud that the whole family got out of their beds to see what was going on, after that I'd never ask him what he was doing downstairs, I'd just take him immediately back to his room. This is my creepiest real story, I'll keep it short, we'd been driving from coast to coast, and in Nebraska, we decided we needed to sleep, we pulled onto a side road and bedded down in the back of our pickup, it had a cap on the back and a mattress in the bed, cool truck, then we heard these blood curdling screams, it was a woman, this was before cell phones. We hear a man grunt and the scream stop rather abruptly. The next morning we heard about a murder in the area. I think we heard a murder. The rational part of my brain. I will not click this. It is a bad idea. I will regret it. I will lose sleep. There, I have made my decision. Now it's time to logo you. Stupid. Retarded. No good very bad part of my brain. Hey look it's a creepy thread I love these ones. As I was reading some of these, the handle on my front door started shaking. I looked through the peephole, darkness there, and nothing more. Hold me, read it. 
at least it wasn't red. Two young kids are upstairs in their room, playing their PlayStation. All of a sudden they hear their mom's voice angrily calling for them from downstairs. They are confused because their mom rarely if ever gets angry at them, and they tell her they will come in a minute. They keep playing, but she screams out again telling them to come right away. They get up and start walking towards the stairs, when their mom appears in a crevasse in a wall, quickly pulling them in and covering their mouths. Scared, she puts her finger to her lips and tells it's okay, I heard it too. Every time I have my one son on their changing table, he stares at the same spot about 5 inches over beside my shoulder, roughly in the direction of their bedroom door. There isn't really anything there to look at, though I know that doesn't mean much for a 5 month old. It really raises the hair on the back of my neck, though, I have to glance over my shoulder all the time to make sure, to creepy things that scared me. Ted's Caving Story, Angel Fire Web Page, and The Diania House Web Page. These are both super old, but they stayed with me because I got so invested in them while reading. Edit, if the Ted site goes down again. Jepic pointed out some mirrors. Archive Web Page. Ah, ah, where is the ending to this story? Edit, Ted's Cave. That is, stops at page 11. Edit 2. Seriously, 2 hours of reading. I need to satisfy this itch. Edit 3. Found some closure. Massive spoilers. Ted the Cave of Mystery John's blog web page. I've told this story before on Reddit, but it's still creepy to me and probably fits here just as well. I had a girlfriend in high school whose stepfather had sexually abused her when she was younger. She had told me about it so I knew. She also would talk in her sleep, and not just say random things. She would start dreaming then start talking and you could talk back to her. She would talk to you but not wake up. One afternoon, she fell asleep and started talking. She kinda started to whine, then said help. I asked what she needed help with. She was telling me that she was in her kitchen and that he was in his room. He wanted to play the game. I told her that I was just outside. All she had to do was come outside and I would save her. She continued to whine, and told me she'd get in trouble. I tried to convince her a couple times to come outside to me, but she wouldn't do it. She was really sounding stressed so I woke her up. It was really weird and I felt so terrible for her. I told her what had happened and she just cried. It may not seem all that creepy like some of the stories here, but damn. When it's happening to you, you really get weirded out by it. Your story is too real. Man that sucks. When I was a child my family moved to a big old two floor house, with big empty rooms and creaking floorboards. Both my parents worked so I was often alone when I came home from school. One early evening when I came home the house was still dark. I called out. Mum and heard her sing song voice say ee's from upstairs. I called her again as I climbed the stairs to see which room she was in. And again got the same ee's reply. We were decorating at the time. And I didn't know my way around the maze of rooms but she was in one of the far ones, right down the hall. I felt uneasy, but I figured that was only natural so I rushed forward to see my mum, knowing that her presence would calm my fears, as a mother's presence always does. Just as I reached for the handle of the door to let myself into the room I heard the front door downstairs open and my mother call sweetie, are you home in a cheery voice, I jumped back, startled and ran down the stairs to her. But as I glanced back from the top of the stairs, the door to the room slowly opened a crack. For a brief moment, I saw something strange in there, and I don't know what it was, but it was staring at me. You know what would have been staring back at me? This, Imga webpage. 100% not clicking on that until tomorrow morning. Edit, did as promised, lolled, was not scared, would click again. A++++. For the love of god how has no one mentioned candle code the following is an archived forum conversation from 4 or 5 years ago. Good luck. Candle Cove. Net Nostalgia Forum. Television. Local. Sky Shale 033. Subject. Candle Cove Local Kids Show. Does anyone remember this kids show? It was called Candle Cove and I must have been 6 or 7. I never found reference to it anywhere so I think it was on a local station around 1971 or 1972. I lived in Ironton at the time. I don't remember which station, but I do remember it was on at a weird time, like 4pm. Mike Painter 65. Subject, Ray, Candle Cove local kids show, it seems really familiar to me, 
I grew up outside of Ashland and was 9 years old in 70 to Candle Cove. Was it about pirates? I remember a pirate Marianese at the mouth of a cave talking to little girl. Sky Shale 033. Subject. Ray. Candle Cove local kids show. Yes. Okay I'm not crazy. I remember pirate Percy. I was always kind of scared of him. He looked like he was built from parts of other dolls. Real low budget. His head was an old porcelain baby doll. Looked like an antique that didn't belong on the body. I don't remember what station this was. I don't think it was WTSF though. Jaren 2005. Subject. Ray. Candle Cove local kids show. Sorry to resurrect this old thread but I know exactly what show you mean. Sky Shale. I think Candle Cove ran for only a couple months in 1971. Not 72. I was 12 and I watched it a few times with my brother. It was channel 58. Whatever station that was. My mom would let me switch to it after the news let me see what I remember. It took place in Candle Cove. And it was about a little girl who imagined herself to be friends with pirates. The pirate ship was called the Laughing Stark. And Pirate Percy wasn't a very good pirate because he got scared too easily. And there was Calliope music constantly playing. Don't remember the girl's name. Janice or Jade or something. Think it was Janice. Sky Shale 033. Subject. Ray. Candle Cove local kids show. Thank you Jaron. Memories flooded back when you mentioned the laughing Stark and channel 58. I remember the bow of the ship was a wooden smiling face. With the lower jaw submerged. It looked like it was swallowing the sea and it had that awful Edwin voice and laugh. I especially remember how jarring it was when they switched from the wooden plastic model. To the foam puppet version of the head that talked. Mike Painter 65. Subject. Ray. Candle Cove local kids show. Haha ha, I remember now too. Do you remember this part Sky Shale? You have to go inside. Sky Shale 033. Subject. Ray. Candle Cove local kids show. Ugh Mike. I got a chill reading that. Yes I remember. That's what the ship always told Percy when there was a spooky place he had to go in. Like a cave or a dark room where the treasure was. And the camera would push in on laughing Stark's face with each pause. You have to go inside with his two eyes askew and that flopping foam jaw and the fishing line that opened and closed it. Ugh, it just looked so cheap and awful. You guys remember the villain? He had a face that was just a handlebar mustache above real at all. Narrow teeth. Kevin Hart. Subject. Ray. Candle Cove local kids show. I honestly, honestly thought the villain was Pirate Percy. I was about five when this show was on Nightmare Fuel. Jaren 2005. Subject. Ray. Candle Cove local kids show. That wasn't the villain. The puppet with the mustache. That was the villain's sidekick. Horace Horrible. He had a monocle too. But it was on top of the mustache. I used to think that meant he had only one eye. But yeah, the villain was another marionette, the skin taker. I can't believe what they let us watch back then. Kevin Hart. Subjects. Ray. Candle Cove local kids show. Jesus H. Christ. The skin taker what kind of a kids show were we watching I seriously could not look at the screen when the skin taker showed up he just descended out of nowhere on his strings. Just a dirty skeleton wearing that brown top hat and cape and his glass eyes that were too big for his skull Christ almighty. Sky Shale 033. Subjects. Ray. Candle Cove local kids show. Wasn't his top hat and cloak all sewn up crazily? Was that supposed to be children's skin? Mike Painter 65. Subject. Ray. Candle Cove local kids show. Yeah I think so remember his mouth didn't open and close. His jaw just slid back and forth I remember the little girl said why does your mouth move like that and the skin. Taker didn't look at the girl but at the camera and said to grind your skin. Sky Shale 033. Subject. Ray. Candle Cove local kids show. I'm so relieved that other people remember this terrible show. I used to have this awful memory. A bad dream I had where the opening jingle ended. The show faded in from black. And all the characters were there. But the camera was just cutting to each of their faces. And they were just screaming. And the puppets and marionettes were flailing spastically. And just all screaming. Screaming the girl was just moaning and crying like she had been through hours of this I woke up many times from that nightmare I used to wet the bed when I had Kevin Hart Subject 
Ray, Candle Cove Local Kids Show. I don't think that was a dream. I remember that. I remember that was an episode. Sky Shale 033. Subjects. Ray, Candle Cove Local Kids Show. No, no, no. Not possible. There was no plot or anything. I mean literally just standing in place crying and screaming for the whole show. Kevin Hart. Subjects. Ray, Candle Cove Local Kids Show. Maybe I'm manufacturing the memory because you said that, but I swear to God I remember seeing what you described they just screamed. Jaren 2005. Subjects. Ray, Candle Cove Local Kids Show. Oh God. Yes. The little girl. Janice. I remember seeing her shake, and the skin taker screaming through his gnashing teeth, his jaw careening so wildly I thought it would come off its wire hinges, I turned it off and it was the last time I watched, I ran to tell my brother and we didn't have the courage to turn it back on, Mike Painter 65, subject, Ray, Candle Cove local kids show, I visited my mom today at the nursing home I asked her about when I was little in the early 70s, when I was 8 or 9 and if she remembered a kids show. Candle Co. she said she was surprised I could remember that and I asked why, and she said because I used to think it was so strange that you said I'm gonna go watch Candle Cove now mom and then you would tune the TV to static and just watch Dead Air for 30 minutes you had a big imagination with your little pirate show. Oh god close window close window, why is Chrome freezing, oh god. So, this is how my grandmother tells the story, it was 1933 and she was 13, living in the middle of Manchester, England. One night she got out of bed to go to the bathroom, and as she wandered through past the staircase, she saw her auntie standing at the top looking out the window. Curious she trotted upstairs and stood next to see what she was looking at, but only saw the back garden and the alleyway out the back. She turned to ask her auntie what she was looking at only to see a nebulous, faceless figure staring back down at her. The figure then reached out her hands and gripped my young grandmother's face. The next thing my grandmother remembers is her older brother, about 27, running down the hall towards them, picking her up and carrying her into the nearest room. She then spent the next week in and out of consciousness, eventually recovering, but now without a sense of smell. Her family insist it was all a hallucination caused by a severe case of influenza, which is probably true, but my grandmother said she never felt safe in that house ever again. She moved to New Zealand about 10 years later and only ever returned to England, and that house. Once before she died, one school day, a boy named Tom was sitting in class and doing math. It was six more minutes until after school. As he was doing his homework, something caught his eye. His desk was next to the window, and he turned and looked to the grass outside. It looked like a picture. When school was over, he ran to the spot where he saw it. He ran fast so that no one else could grab it. He picked it up and smiled. It had a picture of the most beautiful girl he had ever seen. She had a dress with tights on and red shoes, and her hand was formed into a peace sign. She was so beautiful he wanted to meet her, so he ran all over the school and asked everyone if they knew her or have ever seen her before, but everyone he asked said number he was devastated, when he was home, he asked his older sister if she knew the girl, but unfortunately she also said number it was very late, so Tom walked up the stairs, placed the picture on his bedside table and went to sleep, in the middle of the night Tom was awakened by a tap on his window, it was like a nail tapping, he got scared. After the tapping he heard a giggle, he saw a shadow near his window, so he got out of his bed, walked toward his window, opened it up and followed the giggling, by the time he reached it, it was gone, the next day again he asked his neighbors if they knew her, everybody said, sorry, number when his mother came home he even asked her if she knew her, she said number he went to his room, placed the picture on his desk and fell asleep, once again he was awakened by a tapping, he took the picture and followed the giggling. He walked across the road, when suddenly he got hit by a car. He was dead with the picture in his hand. The driver got out of the car and tried to help him, but it was too late. Suddenly he saw the picture and picked it up. He saw a cute girl holding up three fingers. Coffins used to be built with holes in them, attached to six feet of copper tubing and a bell. The tubing would allow air for victims buried under the mistaken impression they were dead. Harold. 
the Oakdale gravedigger, upon hearing a bell, went to go see if it was children pretending to be spirits, sometimes it was also the wind, this time it wasn't either, a voice from below begged, pleaded to be unburied, you Sarah O'Bannon yes a voice assured, you were born on the 17th of September, 1827 yes the gravestone here says you died on the 19th of February no I'm alive, it was a mistake, dig me up, set me free, sorry about this, mom, Harold said, stepping on the bell to silence it and plugging up the copper tube with dirt, but this is August, whatever you is down there, you ain't alive no more, and you ain't coming up, in Russia, coffin has pipe for air, and bell with string, if man is true Soviet, he does not die, when buried, yells for undertaker and rings bell, bell rings, is no wind, undertaker asks, are you later Gorbachev voice says yes born winter of 1927 yes gravestone says died the 20th of February, 1957 neat, I'm still living I'm sorry, but is August, in June, ground will thaw, you must wait for June, and woman is true Soviet, waits for June, forums, sells runescape forum web page, anybody else read the whole story in a shitty Russian accent, Harold the gravedigger, whatever you is down there, you ain't alive no more, and you ain't coming up, Sarah O'Bannon, foolalalalo, guys named August are assholes, I did not write this, but it's easily the best I've ever read, there was a hunter in the woods, who, after a long day hunting, was in the middle of an immense forest, it was getting dark, and having lost his bearings, he decided to head in one direction until he was clear of the increasingly oppressive foliage, after a what seemed like hours, he came across a cabin in a small clearing, realizing how dark it had grown, he decided to see if he could stay there for the night, he approached, and found the door ajar, nobody was inside, the hunter flopped down on the single bed, deciding to explain himself to the owner in the morning, as he looked around, he was surprised to see the walls adorned by many portraits, all painted in incredible detail, without exception. They appeared to be staring down at him, their features twisted into looks of hatred. Staring back, he grew increasingly uncomfortable. Making a concerted effort to ignore the many hateful faces, he turned to face the wall, and exhausted, he fell into a restless sleep. Face down in an unfamiliar bed, he turned blinking in unexpected sunlight. Looking up, he discovered that the cabin had no portraits, only windows. My sister lives in Bacona, India. Their neighbor's relative called her to check on the neighbors as they had not been picking the phone for a day or so. My sister went on to see if everything was alright. She went in their house as the door was not locked and shrieked when she stepped in a pool of blood. Their servant had poisoned the family and slit the throat of each of the family member before stealing everything from the house. My sister could not sleep for a few days after witnessing the most horrible thing in her life dart. Hey Reddit, I don't have a story to add, but I figured this would be a great opportunity to plug the subreddit I just made. It's called, No Sleep, Reddit webpage, and is dedicated to everything scary. Start sharing your other scary stuff. Also, I have no intention to draw away from this post, keep this one thriving. Actually creepier than the story itself. A young girl is left home alone with only her dog to protect her. When night approaches, she locks all the doors and tries to lock all the windows but one won't close. She decides to leave it unlocked and goes to bed. Her dog takes its customary place under her bed. In the deep of night she awakens to a dripping sound coming from the bathroom. The girl is too scared to go check so she reaches her hand under the bed. She feels a reassuring lick from her dog and falls back to sleep. She reawakens to the dripping sound. Reaches her hand down to the dog where she feels the reassuring lick and falls back to sleep. Once more she awakens to the dripping sound. She reaches her hand down and feels the lick of her dog. Now curious about the dripping sound. She gets up and slowly walks towards the bathroom. The dripping sound getting louder as she approaches. She reaches the bathroom and turns on the light. She is greeted by a horrific sight. Hanging from the shower nozzle is her dog with its throat slit open and its blood dripping into the bathtub. Something on the bathroom mirror catches her eye she turns around. Written on the bathroom mirror in her dog's blood are the words humans can lick to. This one always creeped me right the fuck out as a kid. I like this ending better. If you aren't smart enough to realize that the guy was licking her hand, you don't deserve to get scared. Then WHO was tongue? That's pretty creepy. 
though, I can never help myself but to think of the logical conclusion. After reading the message on the mirror, the girl spins around to see a psychopath standing in front of her. She screams. He stabs her to death. Some days later, after the body is found, the killer is then found through old-fashioned police work. He's a reclusive shut-in. White male, middle-aged, male pattern baldness, coke bottle glasses. He was bullied a lot in high school. The story makes the news for a couple days, about the creepy killer, about the poor victim and her poor dog. The man spends the rest of his life in jail, and the rest of us go back to watching American Idol. The end. Years ago my grandfather was dying of complications from Alzheimer's. My little sister gave him a white stuffed bear with a pink heart on the stomach while he was in his deathbed. When you squeeze the bear it said I love you in a pre-recorded voice. He would constantly squeeze the bear and the voice made him smile. My grandpop had the bear in his bed until he passed away. Several days before he died my mother made him promise that he would somehow let them know he had made it there safe. After he died we placed the bear on the mantel above the fireplace. The family gathered shortly after his death to remember him. Just as we all sat down in the living room, the bear started speaking on its own. I love you. I love you. I love you. During boarding school this was making the rounds. Every boarding school has some odd traditional skill students must undertake before graduation. At my school it was knowing how to swim and at my brother's it was ballroom dance classes. Anyway, this specific school had a very outdoorsy tradition and before graduation students were required to spend a long weekend camping alone in the woods. A faculty member would drop the student off after classes on Thursday and pick them up after the weekend. Most students looked forward to the experience as a calm spell before graduation week. With all the family drama and stress of moving out of school, began. A girl is dropped off at the location and has a wonderful time all weekend. She writes in her journal. She takes tons of pictures. She sees lots of wildlife and relishes the calm away from other people. She is very rested by the time she returns to campus. Two weeks later, after the insanity of graduating and moving out of school, she develops her pictures from the trip. As she flips through the photos she realizes that one whole roll of pictures were of her sleeping. Edit. Changed homophone issue. Tell her I'm sorry, I was pretty drunk. Dude, your humor just saved me from a major chill attack. Have an upvote and a comment encouraging others to do the same. This story story within a story was told to me by a friend Mark. During high school Mark was over at his friend's house. We'll just call him Steve BC I don't know his name. They were hanging out in Steve's room after just hanging up a poster of Limp Bizkit's significant other album cover that Steve had just bought. Minutes later Steve's dad comes by and orders him to take the poster down immediately. When he asked his dad why, he says never mind why and to just listen to him and do it. Steve is pissed but listens to his dad and takes it down. Later Steve asked his dad why he told him to take down the poster. This is the story he told him. When I was young, your aunt, uncles and I had to all sleep on the floor in one room because we were very poor. One night someone walked into the room, bent over my head and asked me, give me your soul. I was so afraid I'd pretend to be asleep. This thing would ask me to give him my soul a few times then get up and walk out of the room. This happened every other night until I reached my early teens. One night after he was walking away I opened my eyes to see his face. What I saw was a thing with the body of a human. He wore a hood and underneath the hood was a face of a lizard. A few years before you were born we threw a Halloween party at our house with all of our family. We ran out of candy so I drove to the local market to pick some more up. On the way there I was listening to the radio and they said to call in with your scariest story. I pulled over to the side of the road, called them on a payphone and told the story of this lizard man over the air. When I got back home I could hear someone crying. I went upstairs into the bedroom and saw my sister crying on the bed. I asked her what was wrong. She said, I heard you on the radio. That happened to me too. Edit. Sorry if it isn't clear but the poster reminded his father of the lizard man. On a side note, anyone remember scary stories to tell in the dark? That shit was fucking intense. Yeah but mostly because of the insanely creepy drawings. I just bought the whole collection of them last year. I nearly screamed like a little girl when the story started to get intense, and I turned the page and saw, this, Imga web page, illustrating an entire page, hell, it still creeps me out all of these years later, 
damn you to hell for posting that, that picture freaked me the fuck out when I was little more so than any other illustration in those books, so I click it, thinking oh, there's no way it'll be that one picture that gave me nightmares for years and it was, I did not write these, daddy, I had a bad dream, you blink your eyes and pull up on your elbows, your clock glows red in the darkness it's 323, do you want to climb into bed and tell me about it, no, daddy, the oddness of the situation wakes you up more fully, you can barely make out your daughter's pale form in the darkness of your room, why not sweetie, because in my dream, when I told you about the dream, the thing wearing mommy skin sat up, for a moment, you feel paralyzed, you can't take your eyes off of your daughter, the covers behind you begin to shift, different story, a man went to a hotel and walked up to the front desk to check in, the woman at the desk gave him his key and told him that on the way to his room, there was a door with no number that was locked and no one was allowed in there, especially no one should look inside the room, under any circumstances, so he followed the instructions of the woman at the front desk, going straight to his room, and going to bed, the next night his curiosity would not leave him alone about the room with no number on the door, he walked down the hall to the door and tried the handle, sure enough it was locked, he bent down and looked through the wide keyhole, cold air passed through it, chilling his eye, what he saw was a hotel bedroom, like his, and in the corner was a woman whose skin was completely white, she was leaning her head against the wall, facing away from the door, he stared in confusion for a while, he almost knocked on the door, out of curiosity, but decided not to, this disinclination saved his life, he crept away from the door and walked back to his room, the next day, he returned to the door and looked through the white keyhole, this time, all he saw was redness, he couldn't make anything out besides a distinct red color, unmoving, perhaps the inhabitants of the room knew he was spying the night before, and had blocked the keyhole with something red, at this point he decided to consult a woman at the front desk for more information, she sighed and said, did you look through the keyhole the man told her that he had and she said, well, I might as well tell you the story, a long time ago, a man murdered his wife in that room, and her ghost haunts it, but these people were not ordinary, they were white all over, except for their eyes, which were red, I check into small hotel a few kilometers from Kiev, it is late, I am tired, I tell woman at desk I want a room, she tells me room number and give key, but one more thing comrade, there is one room without number and always lock, don't even peek in there, I take pee and go to room to sleep, night comes and I hear trickling of water, it comes from the room across, I cannot sleep so I open door, it is coming from room with no number, I pound on door, no response, I look in keyhole, I see nothing except red, water still trickling, I go down to front desk to complain, by the way who is in that room she look at me and begin to tell story, there was woman in there, murdered by her husband, skin all white, except her eyes, which were red, I tell her I don't give a shit, stop the water trickling or give me refund, she gave me 100 rubble credit and free breakfast, such is life in Moscow, I'm jacking your thread, save me sky monster, because I suspect our sources are similar, hope you don't mind, I did not write this, I've been lying in my room 4 hours now, it's 5.30 am and there's not much I can do, you know what the worst part of my situation is, I'm in the same room with my parents, they keep looking at me, and I can't help but not look back and try not to cry or scream, their eyes are focused on me and their mouths are wide open, there's a strong scent of blood and I feel so paralyzed with fear, here's the thing, the second I make any hint that I'm not asleep anymore, I'm fucked, I'll die, and there's nobody around to save me, I've been trying to think of a way out, but the only idea I have is to rush for the door, run outside, and scream for help, hoping any neighbors hear me, it's risky, but if I stay here, I'll surely die, he's waiting for me to wake up and see his masterpiece, you're probably wondering what's going on, I do get ahead of myself sometimes, about 3 hours ago I heard screaming from the other side of the house, I got up and went to check the noise before I realized I had to use the restroom, instead of doing the smart, noble thing and investigating, I used the bathroom first, I could have gotten myself killed right then for my stupid actions, but I actually did my business and took a peek outside the bathroom, there was blood on the carpet, as any other sane human would do, I bolted back to my room, hiding under my sheets like the pussy I am, 
I tried to convince myself to go back to sleep, and that this was just some weird, vivid dream or something, but I heard my bedroom door creak open, and like the terrified child I was, I peeked out from under my blankets to see what was going on, I could see something dragging my parents into the room, obviously dead, it was not human, I can tell you that much, it was hairless, with no eyes and no clothing, it walked like a caveman, with its back slouched as it dragged my dead parents, but this thing was smarter than any caveman. It propped my father against the edge of the bed, and made him face me. It then sat my mother down in the chair and positioned her towards me as well. Then, it started rubbing its hands along the walls, staining it with blood, drawing a circle with the devil's pentagram in it. This thing had made what it would probably call a masterpiece. To finish it off, it scrambled a message onto the wall that I could not read in the darkness. It then positioned itself under my bed, waiting to strike. The scariest thing now is, my eyes have adjusted to the darkness, and since then, I can read the message on the wall. I don't want to look at it, because it's terrifying to think about, but I feel I need to see before I'm killed. I peek at the creature's masterpiece. I know you're awake. Was creepy up until the description of the killer. Not trying to seem like a hardass or anything, but that didn't even make me blink. Maybe I should read these things at night instead of in a sunlight filled room at 10am. I'm alone in a dark house, with the sound of rain on the windows and a chill draft creeping underneath my bedroom door. Fuck this bullshit, I'm coming back to this thread tomorrow morning. And then a skeleton popped out. This thread man, oh, creepy, 100% true story, dunno if it'll scare you, but it remains one of the scariest things I've ever experienced. When I was 17, I was at a party at a friend's house, we grew up in a small town, lots of woods, no street lights, houses far apart from one another, etc. There was virtually no crime in this town, except for the abduction of a 5th grader about a decade earlier. Her remains were found behind a restaurant in the town years later, but the case was never solved. My friends and I had been drinking all night, so I didn't want to drive home. That happened to me frequently enough that I always had a sleeping bag in the trunk of my car. Around 2am, I ran out to get the sleeping bag. It was pouring out with thunder and lightning. I could barely see my car, which was parked just beyond the driveway, on the side of the road. When I got to it, I popped the trunk, and dug around for my sleeping bag. There was a flash of lightning in the street lit up for a second. That's when I noticed a middle-aged man standing a few feet from me. He didn't move. He just stood completely still. I can't remember what I said. For all I know, I probably just gasped. However, I remember exactly what he said. I just love thunder and lightning storms. Don't you? Not hello or even sorry. Didn't mean to startle you. I slammed my trunk shut, sleeping bag still in there, and sprinted back to the house. I immediately told everyone what happened. Of course they were drunk, and they thought I was making it up. But I forced them to look out the window toward the driveway. After 30 seconds, lightning struck and the street lit up again. Sure enough, there was the man, walking down the street, in the opposite direction from the house. You could spice it up a bit, more, by changing the ending to the guy being right fucking in front of the window. My computer is right next to my window. Don't talk like that. Oh, for God's sake, it was her mother. I had something happen to me that somehow reminds me of this. I was seven, lying in my bed, reading when a woman I had never seen walked up and sat on the edge of the bed. She wasn't scary at all. In fact, she somehow made me calmer. She said don't look out the window, just keep looking at me. Then she started singing a song I had never heard. She kept singing it over and over, quietly, and petting my hair. Every so often she would stop and tell me not to look out the window. A few years later, I saw a picture of the woman from that night at my grandmother's house. It was her mother, who died when she was 10. She had just gotten the photo from her stepmother, who had been going through her father's belongings. Before that, she had never had a photo of her mother. I'd dismiss it as something I saw at Great Grandma Dixie's house instead and had a dream about. Except that I never in my life went to Great Grandma Dixie's house. Anytime I saw her I saw her at a church or a family picnic. A few years after that, I heard the song again. The song was Molly Malone which I had never heard in any other context. I still remembered the words, 
I asked my grandmother if she had ever heard the song, and she had. It was the song my great grandmother used to sing to her children to calm her down before she died. When I told my mother about it, she asked when it was. Since it was a few days before Easter when I was seven, I was able to give her a vague idea. Turns out, right around that same time, her girlfriend was having nightmares that a ghost was floating outside my bedroom window, trying to pull me out. Much like you, I've always had weird things happen to me, and this is just the most vividly remembered and bizarre. In any city, in any country, go to any mental institution or halfway house and you can get yourself to, when you reach the front desk, ask to visit someone who calls himself the holder of the end. Should a look of childlike fear come over the worker's face, you will then be taken to a cell in the building. It will be in a deep hidden section of the building. All you will hear is the sound of someone talking to themselves echo the halls. It is in a language that you will not understand, but your very soul will feel unspeakable fear. Should the talking stop at any time, stop and quickly say aloud I'm just passing through. I wish to talk. If you still hear silence, flee leave do not stop for anything do not go home don't stay at an inn just keep moving sleep where your body drops you will know in the morning if you've escaped if the voice in the hall comes back after you utter those words continue on upon reaching the cell all you will see is a windowless room with a person in the corner speaking an unknown language and cradling something the person will only respond to one question what happens when they all come together the person will then stare into your eyes and answer your question in horrifying detail. Many go mad in that very cell. Some disappear soon after the meeting. A few end their lives. But most do the worst thing. And look upon the object in the person's hands. You will want to as well. Be warned that if you do, your death will be one of cruelty and unrelenting horror. Your death will be in that room. By that person's hands. That object is one of 2538. They must never come together. Never. More objects here. Fairholder's web page. Then WHO was phone. I was phone. The night that my brother killed himself. I had a dream that he died. And then I woke up. And I went to check on him. And so he was. Colon. Don't know if your story is true or not. And to be honest. I don't know if this one is either but my grandma swears that my grandfather called and apologized a few days after he died from his heart attack. Apparently they made a pact whilst doing dishes one day that one would get in touch with the other when they died. Grandma believes he kept his end of the bargain. Edited to at. Apparently it was very faint and there was a sort of music in the background and she just heard him saying I'm sorry. There's another comment further down the page with someone saying their relative also apologized. Creepy really, what are they apologizing for? Vaguely related, when I was in high school, my friend used to have a tabby cat who I adored and loved to take care of whenever I spent the night. He would always crawl into my bunk. My friend had bunk beds, and she reserved the top one for me, because we were like BFFs, you know. I spent more time at her house than mine, and lick my ears before curling up around my head and falling asleep. She also had a cat who was old and fat and would never go around either of us while we slept. She was far too old and huge to jump up onto the top bunk. A couple of years later, the young tabby cat had his claws stuck to a pillow in the living room, and I went over to help him out. When I picked him up, he let out this long, horrible yowl, shook violently in my arms, and died. Just had a seizure and died in my hands. Apparently, he had brain problems or something. He was always a weird cat. Needless to say, I was traumatized. A couple of days later or so, I was sleeping over at my friend's house, and I was in my bunk, on the edges of consciousness. As I was falling asleep, I felt a cat walking on my pillow around my head. I was too scared to open my eyes. Edited for clarification equals. Thanks for the upvotes, guys. Similar story. I stayed at a friend's place one night sleeping on a cot in the living room a couple times in the night i woke up because his cat jumped up on me the second time i actually woke up enough to look at him and shoo him off the next morning my friend asked how i slept i said fine but i had to shoo your cat off of me a couple times he looked at me with a weird expression what i asked i don't have a cat i don't know what to tell you dude there was a cat no i believe you Everyone who sleeps in that room complains about a cat. I've looked. 
but there's no way for a cat to get in here, and he's never bothered me, weird enough, but about a year later, I was staying there again, this time with a friend who didn't know the guy we were staying with, I was on the cot again, my friend was on the couch, the next morning, while the three of us were waiting for coffee to get done, my uninitiated friend goes, hey, did the cat bother you last night, he kept jumping on me, I looked at the guy who lived there and we just laughed, one of my friends told me this story in high school, and he swears up and down that it is true, one night, this guy was driving back home from his girlfriend's house when a large dog ran out in front of his car, my friend had no time to swerve and hit the dog dead on, being an animal lover, he jumps out of the car to see if the dog is alright or not, but before he can come around to the front, he sees a dog get up on two legs and run off into the field next to him. Anytime I drive by a field now, my blood pressure spikes. Oh shit. Tumblr web page. My friend and I were driving out in the country. This is a small hick town down south. To put some context in this, all the dumb high school kids would go drive on the backfield road and smoke pot. Just farming roads. Mostly dirt or gravel. For various fields. Pretty views and no cops. Anyways. It was late at night and we were going around a tight curve. My friend was going a bit fast and dicking around with his hitter or something. A dog, black lab, runs in middle of the road. The car hits in head on. It goes under the car between the wheels. My friend slams on the brakes, opens his door and gets out. I get out on the passage side and look under the car. I don't see any dog. My friend, in the most panicked and sacred voice I ever heard says my name. I get up and look over the car. There is a man, a filthy man, looks like a bum hobo, standing between my friend and the car door. I say hello, I think we accidentally hit a dog. He looks over at me and give me a hard fucking stare. I'm really fucking freaked out. The man doesn't say anything and starts walking. My friend gets into the car. I jump into the car, close the door and lock it. My friend is super freaked out and starts driving. We're both like fuck fuck fuck, what the fuck man. My heart is racing. We find the quickest way back to the main road. My friend is really shaken up and pulls out on the highway. He's driving like a crazy person. My heart is pounding. It's about ready to rip from my chest. Red and blues. Headlights flash from our rear. Cop car pulls out from the dark behind us. We pull over. The cop says what's the matter boys? You were driving a bit of radiate back there. You boys been drinking. The cop is flashing his flashlight around the car and in our eyes and making us more nervous. My friend was no sir. We hit a dog back there and just a bit freaked out. The cop says you mean that dog while shining the flashlight in the back seat. We both look in the back seat. A dead black lab is laid there. My chest can no longer hold my pounding heart. This is both really gross and creepy. About two years ago I had a roommate who told me this story. She used to work at a hotel in her hometown. A smaller city somewhat more north. A lot of the girls she worked with were in high school as well and a few of them were kinda slutty. One weekend one of her promiscuous co-workers, let's call her Lindsay, gave a blowjob to some guy at a house party. A day or two afterward while at work, Lindsay noticed she had a rash developing around her mouth. She shrugged it off hoping it would go away. But after a couple of days the rash got much much worse. She finally decided to go to the doctor. The doctor had no idea what it was by just looking at it, but took a couple of samples and told her he would call her back once the test results came in. Later on the same day the doctor called Lindsay and said we need you to come back to the hospital right now. When Lindsay got back the doctor said to her you've got to tell me what you have been doing, because what you have around your mouth is contracted from dead people. It turned out that the family of the guy she gave head to owns a funeral home business, and the guy had been fucking the corpses. The funeral home has since been shut down. Truth story, source, creeper pasta, scary stories and original horror fiction webpage. During the summer of 1983, in a quiet town near Minneapolis, Minnesota, the charred body of a woman was found inside the kitchen stove of a small farmhouse. A video camera was also found in the kitchen standing on a tripod and pointing at the oven. No tape was found inside the camera at the time. Although the scene was originally labeled as a homicide by police, an unmarked VHS tape was later discovered at the bottom of the farm's well, which had apparently dried up earlier that year. Despite its worn condition, and the fact that it contained no audio, 
Police were still able to view the contents of the tape. It depicted a woman recording herself in front of a video camera, seemingly using the same camera the police found in the kitchen. After positioning the camera to include both her and her kitchen stove in the image, the tape then showed her turning on the oven, opening the door, crawling inside, and then closing the door behind her. Eight minutes into the video, the oven could be seen shaking violently, after which point thick black smoke could be seen emanating from it. The camera then continued to stationary point at the oven for another 45 minutes until the batteries apparently died. To avoid disturbing the local community, police never released any information about the tape, or even the fact that it was found. Police were also not able to determine who put the tape in the well or why the physical stature of the woman on the tape did not in any way resemble the stature of the woman found in the oven. Then WHO was oven. Here's what happened. The woman who went in the oven was the original woman who lived in the farmhouse. She wanted to kill herself in a fantastic way and videotape it to leave for people to see, presumably because she was insane or had mommy issues. Later, a guy saw the smoke emitted from the oven and rushed there only to find her dead. He saw the video camera and the tape inside. Curiosity struck him to watch the tape. As he watched it, he realized that the woman in the video somewhat resembled his wife. Thus, the man resolved that he could kill his wife, stuff her in the oven, and get rid of the earlier body. He promptly disposed of the tape, realizing that his fingerprints had gotten all over them. You had me until the last line. That was just unnecessary. Oh god not a PDF. In Canada, we call it beaver blood, because it's beavery bad to take too much. Plus we have beavers here. I work on a ship. One night I was having a meal with my crewmates including one guy, Kane, who had recently recovered from an illness. We enjoyed our dinner, excited that we'd be heading home soon. Suddenly Kane started choking and, shortly thereafter, began convulsing wildly. We managed to pin him down and he was yelling. He then let out a loud scream and a large blood stain appeared beneath his shirt. Kane continued to yell in agonizing pain as a snake-like creature violently burst from his chest and scurried off. I will never forget that night. Hello, my baby. Hello, my honey. Hello, my ragtime gal. Send me a kiss by wire. Baby, my heart's on fire. You asked for it. So here is the scariest story I know. The people you went to high school with are going to be leading the country soon. A friend of mine works in IT in a rather large company. About two years ago one of the managers died over a weekend from a sudden heart attack. Everyone was rather distraught, as he was widely liked and respected. About three weeks later my friend was tasked with cleaning up, formatting, the now dead manager's work laptop. As soon as he turned it on, the email program automatically loaded connected to the server and dispatched all the unsent emails in his outbox. Numerous employees suddenly received emails from their dead manager. Creepy but you have the storytelling abilities of a goat. In 1990 I was raped and murdered. So we uh, with a honey and you're making out when the phone rings. You answer it in the vices what are you doing with my daughter you tell her girl and she say my dad is dead. Then WHO was phone, 